Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. As a telephone CSR, I went from being the rookie all-star that the customers loved to a jaded malicious compliance a-hole in four short months. The second story. Karen always stops me after I use self-check. The third story. I didn't return to work when I was needed. On to the first story. Metrics. You get what you measure. Back in the 1989, I worked for a very large telephone company as a customer support representative, CSR, in their billing call center. My first day after completing the required two weeks of training, I received four customer commendations. I received a total of 12 commendations in my first week on the job. This was unheard of. Most CSRs got maybe two to three a month. Not bragging, just stating that I was good at the job, and at only 18 years old, I really like getting the positive attention for doing my job well. So my 30-day evaluation rolls around, and my supervisor takes me aside, and the conversation goes something like this. I will be G, SV will be my supervisor. SV, Gloob, you've received over 20 customer commendations in your first month. That's outstanding. Your attendance is perfect. You've never been late coming back from your breaks. She then shows me a printout with several columns of numbers, metrics, but with one of mine circled in red. There's only one problem. You're spending too much time in work state. G, uh, okay. What is work state and why is that bad? SV, Work state is when you make yourself unavailable for calls. You're only supposed to use it for restroom breaks or when the customer terminates the call before you can complete your work. It says here you're averaging over 70 seconds of work state on every call. That number should never be any higher than 20 seconds. G. Oh, well, the reason why is that once I understand the customer's problem and we agree upon a solution, I thank the customer for calling and then make myself unavailable while I do all the computer work needed to fix their problem. SV. Well, see, we can't have your metrics so far outside the realm of what every other CSR does. Just keep the customer on the line while you do the updates, so that this metric looks as good as your other metrics. Gee, that doesn't make any sense. The customers really appreciate that I'm able to quickly understand their problems, and I'm able to get them fixed quickly. You're asking me to take up more of their time when it isn't needed. SV, I know, sweetie, but please, I don't like having to explain to my boss why your metric is so outside the norm. G. Starting a slow burn inside. Yeah, uh, okay, I guess. For the next 30 days, I kept the customer on the line while I completed every aspect of the call. I would then thank the customer, hang up and then place myself into work state doing absolutely nothing but staring at the second hand of my watch for exactly 20 seconds. Then I would take the next call. Fast forward to my monthly review at 60 days. SV. Gloob, I see that your work state number is now 20 seconds which is good. But see this number here? You can see that your average call time is now just over 310 seconds. We really don't want to see that number above 300 seconds. G. Seething at the lunacy. You told me not to let the customer hang up until I was finished doing the work. SV. I know, but see if you can maybe work a little bit faster? It's only 10 seconds per call. I know you can do it. G. Fine. You want 300 seconds? I'll give you 300 seconds. Yes, I'll make sure that number is not more than 300 next month. SV. That's the spirit. For the next 30 days, I made sure that every single one of my calls took up exactly 5 minutes. As in, if the customer just needed to be transferred to another department, I would put them on hold for 4 minutes and 45 seconds, then come back on the line and say transferring you now. I kept a stopwatch with a lap timer set up so that I would know exactly when my 5 minutes were up, then I would go into work state for 20 seconds, then I would take the next call. Time for the 90 day review. SV. Okay, I'm not sure what exactly is happening here, but I see your productivity is really starting to plummet and we've noticed you haven't had a commendation in over a month. G. I'm not sure I understand. My work state and my average call handling time are both within the expected values. I can see that you track the number of calls each day as well. What's the expected range for that metric? SV gets a strange look on her face. Realization is dawning. We want to see everyone averaging at least 100 calls a day. G. But I'm averaging close to 110. What's the problem? SV. In your first two months, you were taking over 130 calls a day. G but I'm still within your expected metrics, correct? SV, yes, but we already know you can do better. G, slow burn continues. Okay, maybe I don't understand how this is calculated. Are all calls included in all metrics? SV, actually no. If a call lasts under 15 seconds, we assume it's a transfer escalation and it doesn't get included in either your work state or average call times, but it's still included in the total calls metric. That's why it seems like we're asking you to take more calls in a day than is possible. 
The transfers don't take any time to complete, but still get included in your total calls. Gee, okay, I'll see what I can do to increase my total calls per day. So for the next 30 days, same drill as last month, every call takes me exactly 5 minutes to complete, followed by 20 seconds in work state. Only now I kept a notepad next to me and kept tick marks for every call I handled. When I got to my expected 100 calls for the day, every single call that came in after that, I would immediately transfer to the supervisor escalation line, not even bothering to ask the customer for their phone number or why they were calling. The line was supposed to be reserved for irate customers or other issues that were beyond our authority to deal with, but unless I logged into the customer's accounts, the supervisors had no way to tell who escalated the call. I did this exactly 100 times each day at the end of my shift. When I got to 100 of these calls, I logged out of the ACD, call tracking system, and would go hide in the bathroom or break room for about 20 to 30 minutes, until the end of my shift. At my next evaluation, day 120, it was my supervisor and the VP for the entire call center, three levels up, who were at the table. They had the metric sheets for each of the last four months spread out in front of them. They handed a copy to me. VP. S has informed me of the previous conversations you've had with her. She also informs me that every time you discussed a specific metric, the next month that metric would be exactly the minimum number required. Nothing more, nothing less. She's also informed me that at your last meeting, you were requested to increase your average number of calls per day. Gee, that's correct. Did I not achieve the goal this month? VP losing patience. You exactly doubled the number of calls to 200 per day. Nobody has ever taken 200 calls in a day, let alone average that over a full month. In fact, I had the IT staff go back over and pull the metrics for the last two months. Not only are your averages for each metric exactly the minimum acceptable value, every single day is exactly that value. That's simply not possible. I believe you somehow hacked into our ACD system and have modified the tracking entries for yourself. Gee, impressed that they assume I have elite hacker skills, but feigning ignorance. I've not falsified any records. You guys asked me to focus on specific metrics, and I did. I don't see what everyone is so upset about. S. Gloob, I'm honestly not sure that this is going to work out. Aren't you happy? G. Honestly, not really since we started focusing on metrics. Sorry, this is too long already. I'll leave out the drama over the ACD vendor, Rockwell slash Collins, having to fly someone in to try to find out how I was hacking their system to do this, in the popular culture sense of the word. Their threats of termination, the ultimate involvement of our union steward, or the final screw you I left behind on my last day. Anyway, I lasted about four weeks after that. Just enough time for me to start looking for another job, and for me to get my two weeks notice once I found it. I've matured significantly since I had this job. Honestly, I now feel bad for just about everyone, including the customers that I undoubtedly peeved off there at the end. But I never forgot a very important business lesson that I still use when managing employees today. You get what you measure, but are you measuring the right things? The second story is, you want my receipt? Here you go, it's all yours. Short story about your favorite Arkansas-based retailer involving myself and a Karen worker. So, I've been going to the same Walmart for about five years. The wife and I get groceries on Sunday. Then I usually stop during the week for an energy drink or Pepsi and a snack for lunch. Wonderfully healthy, I know. Well, after getting self-checkouts a few years ago, we now have a Karen who's replaced the smiley face sticker person and stops folks who don't use self-checkout to scan their receipt and a random item, as far as I can tell, to make sure they've paid. For reference, she stands about 10 feet directly in front of the self-check area and always stops me after I use self-check. Which is basically infuriating because 1. I never see anyone else get stopped from self-check. 2. She watches me wait and pay for my stuff. 3. I only ever have 2-3 to three items in one hand and a receipt in the other, no bag, so it's like Sherlock-level logic to figure out what's going on. So I hatched a brilliant plan, to hand her my receipt and keep walking. At first she looked confused, and I would say things like, have a great day, and smile, while she's chasing me down with a receipt for 323 for a low-carb monster and bag of chips, to which I would reply, I don't need it, and not take the receipt from her. This went on for about a good two-month period, until she realized if she did so much as acknowledge my existence, she would be left with a receipt to dispose of. As funny as this is, it gets better. Last Sunday, my wife and I got a bunch of stuff and went through a regular line, at this Walmart. As we're getting close to the door, my wife, who has no idea of how I've been handling receipts to Karen, tries to hand this lady our receipt to which she's ignored, like completely, can't see you Harry Potter cape ignored by Karen, and she's looking pretty confused. As soon as we hit the double door lobby, my wife says, wow, that's so strange, she always wants my receipt, to which I start laughing probably too hard, and she figures out something is up. She regularly remarks on my ability to make friends wherever I go. On a positive note, she may not want to take me to Walmart tomorrow. The last story is, you won't listen when I say you should let me train the next intern? Fine, twice. So this happened twice at two different companies. 
When I did my first internship, I was supposed to just help another guy do his tasks and launch a new pilot project. However, a couple of months into it, he wasn't that interested in the project or the position overall, so he just gave me the project to manage. By then, I was much more experienced using it than he was, so I just kept managing the project by myself. Two months before my internship ended, the guy left the position and my manager gave me his tasks, which I did because he had taught me how to do them. By then, I thought I was irreplaceable enough that my manager would just hire me, and one month before the internship ended, I asked her if she was planning on hiring me. She told me she wasn't because I didn't have my master's yet, so she couldn't hire me. I told her I could do everything that was required. Why did I have to have a master's? She just told me she wouldn't hire me. Fine. I asked her if she was planning on hiring someone soon, so I could teach them the tasks in the project. She basically dismissed me and told me I didn't need one month to train the next person. A few days later, I got another internship that would start almost right after this one ended, and she still hadn't hired anyone new. The Monday of my last week, the new person comes in, and my manager asks me to teach her what she should do, and gradually hands over my tasks. I gladly comply, and the new girl immediately understands that the project, which by then had grown, and the other tasks were too complicated and technical, and couldn't be taught in one week. She talks to our manager, and she dismisses us. I leave the internship and get a call the following week, from my manager, asking me if I could stay one more month paid, just to teach the new girl. I say I can't. She offers to hire me. I say I don't want it. The salary was lower than my new internship, and I was fed up with her. A few weeks later, I learned that the new girl had quit and that the project had been canceled and my ex-manager had been put on a career re-evaluation program, aka she was probably going to get demoted. On my next internship, something similar happens. I was supposed to just help a girl with the launch of a new project. Halfway through the internship, I'm managing the project, which had also grown to include a new sub-project and was doing all of its reporting and helping some other people as well. My manager tells me he's planning on hiring me, so I keep working as hard as I can. However, two months before my internship ends, our team is fused with another and we get a new director. She has a clear bias for the other team, which she used to manage, and that team also has an intern they want to hire, but they can only hire one of us. She decides on the other one. Fine. One month until my internship ends and nothing, I get a new job lined up as a consultant at the same company, and my manager, poor guy, is doing everything he can to keep me. Our director keeps refusing, and two weeks before the end she hires a new intern. I start training him but it's too technical and by then I was doing things for other members of the team so I had to train them in those as well. I leave the team but since I'm still at the same company as a consultant they can still reach me through teams. The week after I leave my ex-director messages me and asks me if I can spend an afternoon training the new intern. I say sure. If you're willing to pay my company's rate, she says she can't because she doesn't have the budget. Well then, isn't that too bad? I hope you enjoyed the stories. Have a good one.